Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see everyone here tonight. Made it out in the rain. Hopefully, it won't get too bad. I did hear they had some tornadoes down around Alabama and in Mississippi. I don't know how bad they were. I didn't get to see the news yet. But let's pray for those individuals in that area of the country. And anybody that has kinfolk down that way, I know my mom uh, told me about texting a cousin we have in Tuscaloosa. And I heard may, they might have had some tornadoes. So let's just be mindful of those individuals down that way. <clears throat> Please remember our Bible classes um, Sunday mornings at 9.30 and 10.30 on, for worship services. And also for our Wednesday night services, we're meeting at 6.30. And good to have you here joining us on uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube as you watch this video uh, later tonight or tomorrow or whenever uh, when it's being recorded for tonight. Excuse me, I'm just trying to get straightened out here a little bit. Um, Mops and Moms Next will be meeting tomorrow night, Thursday, March 18th at 7 p.m. And they'll be meeting out in the, back in the fellowship hall. And then next Thursday, the ambassadors will be delivering another meal. And there's other news and information on our website and social media pages, Facebook and YouTube. For those individuals that are here and also on um, Facebook and YouTube, um, if you downloaded the church app, uh, the Congregate app, it, up, it um, up, uh, upgraded uh, this past weekend, over the weekend, and we caught that. It shouldn't cause you any problems, but if it does, uh, just give us a call, and Eli and I will help you through that process. Uh, we've had a few people forget their passwords. We can help you reset your passwords, all that good stuff, and work you th walk you through that process. Anyone here in the auditorium tonight that wants to see me after class, I'll try to help you out and make sure you're uh, getting it properly on your phone or whatever the case may be. Let's join tonight in prayer as we begin our study. Dear Father, we thank you again for today, and we thank you for the many blessings. We thank you for the rain that we're receiving to replenish the earth, and we thank you for uh, the goodness that that brings. But dear Father, also, we see your power um, in storms and, and things that happen, and dear Father, we know that's just part of uh, life and nature, and we pray for those individuals that might have went through um, some tough times down in that area south of us and we just ask you to be upon them and be with their communities and ones uh, helping them during this tough time dear father we ask and pray that you be with those individuals on our prayer list as we continue to pray for them and and care for them and there uh, also be with their uh, loved ones that are caring for them during this time be with those that are um, having some issues with covid and re re uh, re um, Getting, gaining their health over the over this process, and we just ask and pray that you be with them, and be with us as a uh, church family that we can reach out to them and just pray for them, call them, send them a card, do the best that we can to uh, show them how much we love them and and want to be there with them. Dear Father, again we thank you for tonight, and we thank you for the opportunity we have to study another portion of our Word, and also for our classes in the back for the children back on um, in the fellowship hall and Eli over in the warehouse with the teens. Just be with all of us during this evening and you get us home safe and return us back the next time. Thank you again for your son till then we pray. Amen. So, like I said, good evening everyone. Thank you for joining us and um, thank you for watching us on YouTube or Facebook. Tonight we're going to continue our study of the book of Hebrews. And tonight we're going to be focusing our attention, we're in chapter 5, so that's where we'll be doing uh, most, uh, all of our attention towards. We, we will go back and gra grab a couple verses of verse of chapter 4 there at the end, here at the start of the lesson. So throughout all of our previous lessons, we've been focusing upon what the Hebrew writer is trying to get across to the reader to understand. He's been sharing with us the story of Jesus and how he's come to earth. And to show us the example of how we need to live and set up the new law of the gospel. So the overall theme that we've been focusing upon is to find something better. And that was previously seen as a way that one needed to follow um, in, our, in our study and also what the Hebrew writer is trying to get. He wants us to get something better out of what Jesus is bringing us. 
So instead of following Moses and the Mosaic law, the reader of the book of Hebrews, and that's including us now, not just those uh, uh, Christians back in that day, we're turning our attention to Jesus, who's going to give us to have a, choice, a chance of inheriting everlasting life and also the kingdom of God. So if we think about this, the best for his people, God has always wanted what is best for his people. He even went so far to promise the best for his followers. Ever since the beginning of time and creation, God won the best for all of us. And we can see evidence of this throughout the book, throughout the Bible. You know, you think about the best uh, home, the Garden of Eden, when he established the Garden of Eden. He wanted the best for us in a Savior, so he had his son born of human, of earthly of an earthly birth and brought him there. So the birth of his son was something that was, was the best for us at that time. And he also had that guidance of his son through his teaching of the gospel, through those messages. And then it almost had to go to a tremendous and hard and painful outcome of the death of a son upon the cross. Even though that was tragic, even though that seemed a little bit harsh or hard for some of us, or maybe even for his son, it was the best for us. It was ultimately necessary for us to understand and how we need to be true followers of Jesus Christ and God. Let's look back at Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, where Paul says this, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. God has always promised and intended to provide the best for his people. If we think back to our other previous lessons, we know that the Hebrew writer has established several different reasons why the Jewish Christians should be putting Christianity ahead of Judaism. If they, like you know, I believe we have, would realize that none of the previous ways of living are necessary anymore. Just like realizing they had in God, just realizing what they had in God and not in Egypt, seeing that they should follow him and not lose sight of the promised land, and many other things that we have talked about over the last few weeks. They were ultimately turning their backs on God. They were turning away from God. And they were, they were not seeing what was laying out in front of them. They were hardening their hearts. We talked about that a few weeks ago and also last week. They were hardening their hearts to the word of God. I and we, uh, unfortunately, you know, we see that in today's world. We see people turning their backs on Christ and not necessarily wanting to go back to Judaism, like the Hebrew writer is talking about, but going back to other things that are taking them away from God, Christ, and the church. It could be earthly indulgences, it could be personal endeavors, or whatever leads them away from the gospel message. People think they see the betterment in things of the world instead of a better life with God in Christ. And you know what? They and some of us might be acting like the Israelites in the Old Testament and the Jewish Christians that heard the Hebrew writer back in A.D. 60. We need to remember that he made it very clear to them that Jesus was better than the angels. He showed them that Jesus was better than Moses. And then in Hebrews 14 and verse, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, and here in the beginning of chapter 5, he's going to establish that Jesus Christ is even better than Aaron, the high priest. Christ is superior in his position. So let's go back and look at that uh, passage from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. And this is the message uh, rendition or a translation of this, uh, these few chapters. It says, now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest, with ready access to God. Let's not, let us not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all all but the sin so let us walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give take mercy and accept the help we see here that jesus is exalted as our high priest 
it shows us that Aaron could pass. You know, we, you, if you think about the high priest and what we've learned from the Old Testament, you know, Aaron could pass from the veils into the holy of holies. But Jesus, as the Son of God, can pass through heaven right to God. And we need to remember that Jesus was just like us to some degree, as it's stated here, because he lived upon this earth as a man. This qualified him to be a high priest because he faced temptation just as we have and do every day. But unlike us, it shows right there, he remained free from sin. And if we want to think back to that temptation, all we must do is refer back to that passage in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, where he faced those three different temptations while out in the wilderness. He successfully overcame all those temptations. He lived just as we do. So that gives him the credentials to also sympathize with us as a human being. So if we look here at the beginning of chapter 5, it brings us to this first part here in verses 1 through 4. So let's read these verses 1 through 4, and this is the English Standard Version up on the screen. It says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weaknesses. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. It clearly states in this verse that every high priest is, a, is selected from among men. The high priest just does not take office because he wants to have it, nor is he appointed by an election of the people. The office, is the, high, uh, the office of the high priest is established by God, and the one to occupy the position will be called by God. If we, ask, we must remember, Aaron was called by God back in the Old Testament, and now we are seeing that God wants the best for all of his followers. So he has called upon Jesus Christ to now assume the role of high priest. But you might be asking yourself a question. Why is this so important that it is being established that Jesus Christ is now our high priest? But now let me flip that a little bit and ask you this question. Could man really gain access to God back in the day? You know, I rem if you remember, I think the answer right there is no. Because according to the old covenant, because it was made very clear that the high priest was the one that could draw near to God, and then sometimes that was only under special conditions. But now, with Christ being established as our better choice of high priest, it is now through his blood, there is now a clear path to heaven through God's one and only Son. Let's read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, under this new covenant, the promise that God has given us through the gospel message, everyone is offered access to God and heaven. So what is this promise of a high priest? You know, as you sit here tonight or while you're watching on YouTube or Facebook or our social media pages, you might not be giving much thought to having a priest. You know, the other day, Steve and I attended the funeral of Brad Herndon's father at the Methodist Church. And as we watched the two pastors that were going to oversee the services enter the room, we both kind of looked at each other and said, in some fashion or form, I can't remember how we both said it, but we kind of looked at each other. We kind of looked and said, we need some of those. Now, we weren't trying to be disrespectful or anything, but what we were talking about were their nice clean and very white robes that each of the men were wearing. You know, many other religions have their ministers or pastors wear robes that they adorn during a worship or a special service. You know, sometimes I think they look a little cool and nice. I told Steve, I said, I think I could maybe pull off a purple one one day. You know, it does bring some attention to the main person in charge of leading that congregation at that time. Some of the robes are significant in nature, as I said, because of a certain service or maybe a time of the year. And like I said, I think it feels 
It shows that importance or stature of the position of leading that congregation at that time. It shows authority and a certain dignification of the role of that minister is serving. Now I say all that to say this. Does that make him, the person wearing that robe, does it make them a high priest? Well, of course, the answer is no. But just because me and Steve and even Eli, for that matter, being ministers up here on staff and us being up here in the pulpit, does it make us high priest of you and the rest of this church? And of course, the answer is no. The point that I'm trying to make is God has given us only one promise of who our high priest will be, and that is Jesus Christ. The two pastors I were referring to, the three of us as ministers here at this church and others that serve churches the world over, all of us are just servants of the Lord's church at that certain place. None of us will ever be the high priest because Jesus is the only one that can fulfill that promise that God has given all of us. Hebrews 8, chapter 1, excuse me, Hebrews 8, verse 1. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Jesus fulfilled the promise of blessing and forgiveness of sin. We've been given that gift of salvation because Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, the high priest, he is greater than anything. So I really want you to think about the next question that I'm going to ask you. Do you truly appreciate the work of Jesus as our high priest? You know, as we were working our way through here in Hebrews chapter 5, we will see that the writer is comparing the role of the Jewish high priest with that of the high priest ministry of Jesus. We've already seen in the first few verses of chapter 5 that we see how great an appointment this is for Jesus. You know, we, we talked about Aaron. Aaron was appointed by God back in the days of the Old Testament. And the others after that were chosen from that lineage. God established this unchangeable priesthood back in Exodus chapter 28 through chapter 31. But that all changed when Jesus was appointed by God, his son. Jesus would now be our king, chosen by God, and he would now be the one all would serve, not only as king, but a mediator and intercessor. Jesus, as we stated earlier, is currently sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. He has combined all three anointed offices of prophet, priest, and king. But in us trying to appreciate him, even, though, even more than we might already do, we need to focus upon a few things that he represents. Some of the certain characteristics that he shows us as high priest, they're pretty evident to us. He was very humble in receiving the duty because he did not glorify himself upon becoming this high priest. That is seen there in verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 5. He also shows the characteristic of being very compassionate, more so than one of the high priests from the days back in the Old Testament. You know, if you think back to their role and how they could possibly see countless number of people daily, all searching and longing to serve and please God, you know, it could have been, been, been easy to become very callous as a human being to a person who could not get their act together. Somebody that just kept on coming back and seeing them for the same old thing. Or maybe even doing those continuous daily rituals and sacrifices going on constantly. They might have wore on them as a human being. And you know well, what? I, I kind of get it. Because there's been times that I've tried to help someone. And you help them and then they make a mistake again. And you help them and they make a mistake again. And I just want to shake them and say... Quit making that same mistake. Just turn to God. It kind of wears on you. And maybe you know, and maybe you've tried to help somebody in that same way. It wears on you as a human being. You know, but not Jesus. He is the perfect high priest. And as we read back in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 16, he's not weak like we are because he can sympathize with us in perfect ways. 
so we can ultimately approach the throne of God with boldness when we need it. The compassion he has for all of us is second to none, and we do not never, ever forget, need to forget it. His humbleness to receiving the appointment of the high priest is also very prevalent in how demanded this appointment was going to be. If we look here in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, it says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. The job of priesthood was very demanding of having a humbleness before God. And as we have seen from the life of Jesus, he was very obedient, and he was a selfless servant of his heavenly father. And that is something we need to truly remember. He obeyed perfectly even when it meant suffering and hurting for the work of God. Through everything that he did upon this earth, it should show us that he was the greatest earthly high priest to ever walk upon the face of this world. Because of this, God appointed him as a perpetual high priest. In verses 9 through 10, it says, And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We are, and ne we, we are never, ever going to find another one who is greater. Anyone who is trying to find something in their life is never, ever going to find anyone greater that they need to follow that they need to love upon, that they need to understand that they are there for them. And sometimes that is hard for people because they can't see him. But we need to learn how to show that, and they need to learn how they can see him. He is someone, as we know, that we need to model our lives after. We need to remember that he was chosen. Psalms 110 verse 4 and David writes this it says the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek Jesus even though he died upon the cross we know that he truly lives because his life could not be destroyed by death and here David prophesied to that in the book of Psalms he was a human who lived upon this earth he prayed he petitioned to God, he cried, and he wept. He suffered. Even though it was hard, it taught Jesus obedience to God. He was perfect, and this was accomplished by his death and resurrection. And then we've said this a number of times, he was obedient. God appointed him, and Jesus responded with faith and that complete obedience and a redemptive suffering. But here in the latter part of chapter 5, the Hebrew writer lays out a bit of a warning to those that are reading this wonderful letter. Let's read this passage from Hebrews 5, verses 11 through 14. It says, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Back in verse 11, he begins by letting us know that many of us are going to be slow to learn. You know, many times, many of us we want to hear only what we want to hear. We don't really dive in and get to the bottom of the true meaning that are the words that we read or hear. And what the Hebrew writer is trying, I think, to get across to the reader back during the time really does apply to us today as well. You see, he was basically saying that one that does not study and familiarize themselves with the words of God will be unprepared. And that such a person would be unable to possibly defend their faith even become, become, and even become a teacher of the word. And he stated that in verse 12. You know, it is our duty to learn and understand how we can relay the message of Jesus Christ to the church. 
For some of us, we might be the best thing that comes into the lives of one of our family members and friends. You know, we have all been given the duty of being a minister of the gospel. Yes, uh, you do have us here on staff, myself, Steve, and Eli, to maybe help you along the way, to lift you up, to edify you. But we might not be the best people or person to lead others that you know to be followers of Jesus. You can be a minister too. Our church and any church, you know, could be in a lot of trouble if we don't take it serious about our teaching and discipleship. Discipleship should be at the heart of all church life. If we are not really learning by the gospel message, then we are not committed to being a disciple. Yes, it is important for us to assemble together and edify one another. It is important for us to be in classes, in worship, and in every possible avenue of learning, we can be here at the building with one another. However, it is equally important to us to be in personal study and reflection on our own to help us draw closer to God. I think the writer is basically chastising the reader in these later verses by saying, there in verse 12, it says, you need milk, not solid food. By saying that one is immature and behaving like a baby when we do not adequate or acquaint our, ourselves with the teachings about righteousness. And in verse 14, he concludes the chapter by challenging the reader to realize that solid food is for mature who by consistent use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You know, we can come to church, we can hear good lessons, we can hear a good Bible study, we can go to a good class, we can have wonderful singing, we can also read our Bibles at home, listen to church, Christian music maybe on the radio, maybe even listen to an inspirational speaker uh, from another church or even a good Christian podcast or two. But none of that is going to matter if we don't put any of those things into practice. And what I mean by that is that through all the ups and downs that we go through, we need to learn not only to come to church, but we've got to go out and be the church. We need to be the church that God and Jesus wants us to be so that we can be disciplined enough to discern between good and evil. We need to consistently know how to choose the right and reject the wrong and be more responsible towards maturing in Christ. Let's read the same passage. I think it was this translation of the message. It says, I have a lot more to say about this, but it's hard to get it across to you since you picked up this bad habit of not listening. By this time, you ought to be teachers yourselves. Yet you, here I find you need someone to sit down with you and go over the basics on God again, starting from square one. Baby's milk when you should have been on solid food long ago. Milk is for beginners. Inexperienced in God's ways, solid food is for the mature who have some practice in telling right from wrong. The mature Christian is not a perfect Christian, but they are really close in the sense that their lifestyle reflects what a true follower of Christ should be. And as Christians... We should not abandon the basics, but build upon them. A quote that I found said this, A solid foundation is absolutely necessary, but it is not a substitute for a superstructure. Here in the last part, we need to look at the overall theme of the Bible, and I think it's this, God's love for man. He gave his one and only son for all of us in John 3.16. We know that passage well. Man could not be redeemed without blood in Hebrews 9, 22. And there in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 19, man could only be saved by that precious blood. And the only way all that was offered was by work of Christ as our high priest. He made salvation possible by offering his life as a true sacrifice through his blood. One final passage I'd like to share with you tonight. Revelation 1 verse 5. It says Jesus Christ the faithful witness. The firstborn of the dead. And the ruler of the kings on earth. To him who loves us. And has freed us from our sins. By his blood. Jesus Christ is our true 
one and only high priest. And we need to learn to follow him better than ever because there's no one else that's ever going to take his place. There's no one else to choose from that is going to give us what he has given us already and what he continues to give us in our daily lives. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you again for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to study a portion of the word. And dear Father, we thank you for the wonderful message that you have given us all these many years. And we thank you for so much for everyone that has given us examples throughout the Bible that we can learn from them and understand or what we can take from them and also what we can change. And dear and Father, we understand what the Hebrew writer is trying to get us to understand that, yes, some of that was good back in the old, but now we have the new. And what, you, what he was trying to get across to the, the reader back in that day also applies to us. That we need to understand that Jesus Christ is our high priest and the one that we need to follow. The one that is there for us. The one that we need to, to um, base our lives upon and to live our lives upon and just to do the best that we can. And to strengthen ourselves and not, not be away from one another. Not be away from our church family. Not to, not to uh, do things that we don't need to do but to strengthen one another. And we can do that through um, our brotherly love and our sisterly love for one another. But dear and Father, we can also do it through your son because he is the one that we need to ultimately turn to. And then that will help us in um, retrospect to go out and to teach others, to share with others, and to not only come to a church building, because the church building is just a place we assemble. We need to go out, as we said earlier, and be the church that you want us to be to bring others closer to you and to help them find their true high priest that they need to follow. Be with us each and every day as we go out. Be with us as we um, do the will of, of you and your son all the days of our lives. We thank you again for his life. We thank you for his um, birth, his death, his, his burial, and his resurrection from all that he went through. And it's in through your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you and have a good night.